Uh, right, so this is the virtualization and the containerization buff. Uh, it's up to you what we want to talk about. We at HPE, we are interested in a bit of both. We used to run a public cloud, we don't anymore. So there's a bit of virtualization there. Uh, yeah, part of my day job is helping out support for uh, the virtualization uh, team. So uh, the team that uh, um, uh, supports the, pub the private cloud product. We turn our public cloud into a private cloud. Uh, we're also just starting uh, getting serious about containerization. Uh, it's pretty popular. Docker, you know, a lot, a lot of our customers are asking a lot about Docker and are doing things already with Docker. And we are looking at, uh, you know, starting to look at that more seriously. So, what's everyone else? What's anyone? What's everyone else doing with Docker and or virtualization? I mean, is there, is there more interest in virtualization or containers? Containers. Containers? Anyone else for containers? <laughs> but not Docker. But not Docker. That might be <laughs> hard. <laughs> Actually, in this area, there's a lot of going on currently. So, yes, I would think a little about containerization, but this, we avoid passwords, which, uh, which are here everywhere. So, really, I'm more interested in what's good and what's not so good. And not oh, yes, uh, here another 50 passwords where I couldn't use on my bingo card. Okay, no jargon. So I've actually got a follow-up question to your talk this morning, and maybe this is a starting point for this conversation. Uh, one of the questions I'm wondering around, uh, wondering about in the context of contra containerization is how to handle security updates. And it sounds like there's no good solution in the community so far, in particular when it comes to tooling. I guess some of like the first step of the answer is to uh, provide or use good build tools that actually integrate into building containers, and then use CD to actually push out security updates in a timely fashion. But I think if we as Debian kind of provide support for containers by default, then this should be a question that should be answered, and we should have a solution for users available. What do you mean by containers by default? Let's say a few more words about that. Uh, basically, what you mentioned this morning that the Debian kind of does not lag behind when it comes to containers and, and provides some sort of support for containers. And okay. uh, it's something I've been looking at for, for a bit because I uh, unfortunately have to maintain a bit of Docker-based infrastructure. And so, unfortunately. And um, basically, the main issue is that you cannot really pass a Docker file and figure out what is installed in that. So I've been looking at using other tools where I can literally declare a manifest saying, okay, these are my apt sources, these are the packages I want installed, those are my uh, apt pins. And basically, based on that, uh, take a, basically get at the end of the build a list of installed packages and versions and uh, look at basically be able to just pass the manifest, pass that list, and check if the thing needs to be rebuilt after the uh, repository changes. But unfortunately, I am pretty much convinced that it involves making people not use Docker for container builds. Because Docker will just tell you, oh yeah, slap some stuff on top of a Debian-based uh, container and uh, just run, run a bunch of random commands to install stuff. And that's pretty much non passable in practice. I guess just mostly rephrasing what you just said. I, I guess like inspection and, and some way to inventorize what you have is probably an important first step to make this work, or it needs to be part of the tooling that is available to users such that they can integrate that into their infrastructure. So it sounds like there's a Quite a bit of overlap between this and the cloud images. Mm, yeah, I think it's a uh, uh, <clears throat> step towards maturity uh, when you use Docker for a while and then suddenly realize yeah, you can't really 
download random stuff off, off the internet and put it into production, or you need to, okay, right, we need a CI, CD system, build a base image, how do we do security updates? So I think uh, everyone, everyone goes through that after the initial excitement has worn off. <laughs> So since you are mentioning that we need CI, uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment, and so on, let's avoid a bit the acronym overload. Um, something I haven't seen many people uh, working on is also how do I fetch updates for my containers securely? And like Docker has been working with not hurry on container signing, but it's kind of not really convincing right now. So for people who don't know Notary, basically they are using um, uh, more or less a specification called the update framework to uh, make, basically to sign a, a container updates. And the main issue is that they basically consider that every different Docker image is a different uh, a repository. And it's basically Basically, at that point, they say, okay, the first time you download the Docker image, you are going to trust that you get the right keys, and after that, all the updates are signed. It's kind of as if um, I told you, okay, every time you apt install a new package, you can get something wrong, but if you got it right the first time, uh, I'm going to guarantee that all your upgrades after that are going to be right. And it's kind of really not what you would expect, because apt gives you a much higher level of security than that. Apt guarantees you, okay, if your Debian install is good and you didn't add any shoddy keys to the trusted uh, list, then it's all going to be good. And yes, yeah, there is, like currently, I, beyond what Notary does, I haven't seen anything going on with container signing, which is um, fairly problematic in some ways. So I've, has anyone here done anything with regards to actually securely deploying container updates and so on? Crickets. <laughs> Did I, the ISC do something? No, it seems not. I believe Rocket have some, I don't need it. <laughs> uh, you know, I believe Rocket do some uh, secure, something secure. I haven't looked into it too deeply, but they seem to have considered the issue of security a bit more. Uh, seriously and upfront than than Docker has. At least it seems to me, anyway. Okay, so perhaps, yeah. perhaps that's something we can look into. Oh, Sven, mm. here is uh, the mic. Okay. So, uh, Sam Hartman, um, Docker is the only container system. Well, okay, Docker is one of the container systems I haven't looked at. I've kind of looked at many of the others, and it, I mean, I, I really, the kernel. This is all the same technology, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So the thing I'm running into is like trying to actually deploy containers that I think might plausibly be secure. So really trying to lock down the capability bounding set. And I've found that like particularly if I'm doing a container on top of a real OS, and I apologize if you, you may just say, oh Sam, I covered this in my talk this morning. You you know, you were not there, so you lose. Um but like particularly system D really wants a lot of capabilities in a guest. Um, it particularly seems to really want cap ad admin, for example, mm -hmm. or it gets very grumpy about its inability to do anything to mount sysfs, um, even if you've you know, tried to provide it a reasonable sysfs and a secret fs and, and that sort of thing, it, it kind of insists on managing that himself. Um, are there like techniques that actually work effectively for you know getting a container running with a really restricted bounding set? Um, and, and actually, like, pretty locked down. Does uh, anyone have any thoughts on that? System, system D? Um, oh, yeah, here it is. So, um, it don't really have a good answer for running system D in containers. I pretty much have the same problem. Uh, however, um, I mean, if you don't mind starting di directly your daemon, uh, either through the init.d script or through basically by calling it yourself, you can more or less, uh, pretty much 
reduce enormously the capabilities you need, but on the other hand, it, it means that your container build is much more custom and you cannot yeah. just say uh, it's Debian with a bunch of services. Right. And yeah, yuck is the right reaction, mm -hmm. I guess. Why, why, given that, do people prefer containers to very, well, I guess there are situations where you don't care about security. Okay, fine. <laughs> Someone should take this mic and do something. Yeah, about the init system thing, it seems almost an article of faith by Docker that you do not run an init system, you just run a single daemon in your container. But uh, um, A lot of people disagree with that as a, the subject of a a lot of emails, whether that's a good idea or not, and I mean, there's, yeah. Well, but, okay, fine, so. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm yes. Okay. So let's just say I wanted to do that. But, uh, so what happens when three years from now, my daemon depends on systemd services? You know, it depends on socket activation. Um, it depends on being able to get C group man manipulation for its subchildren, that sort of thing. Uh, it depends on being able to create scopes. I mean, that's all great for that one demon today, but what happens as we look at the forward evolution of our technologies? Yeah, I think it's a nice idea running one, exactly one demon, but I don't think it's practical for a, a lot of cases. No, but it's not even about running. Mm. Oh, I misunderstood you, but as far as I understood, it's not even about running many demons or one demon, mm. but also about the demon, the one demon we want to run that would at some point start to rely on actually having system D uh, functionality in there. Um, and it's true that some software is actually trying, uh, starting to do that now. Mm. And so it seems we kind of have both sides, both uh, being able to just say, oh, yeah, we can just install a bunch of Debian packages in the container and configure them. And on the other hand, being able to say, if we do that, if we can support that, then we also know we will be able to support packages or demons in three, five years. I was really hoping for a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not on the not okay. side. Question is, am I on? Hey. Uh, so I guess the question is, um, like, if we assume that in a couple of years from now we need all these capabilities, uh, why do we assume that they have to be provided from within the container? Uh, the container management thing or container technology could also provide those same um, features to us. Um, Sorry. And Charles, uh, if the container runtime provides us something system like enough you know, uh, that we can run things, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the comment was along the lines of, uh, well, if the container management thing could provide those features, that would probably work. I guess, I mean, the question is how to implement that. It could be that the functionality would be duplicated, which would obviously be bad. It could be that it's some sort of pass-through mode. It could be that systemd just knows how to work with the container and it's something that the systemd from outside the container would provide and then this is passed through or, or whatever. Yeah, I mean, that last one I guess that's good. like an open technical question because we don't know what the future will bring and depending on what the future will bring, uh, this will have to be taken into account, right? Mm. Um, like going back a bit to the, the start of that conversation, I'm actually interested why you would want to have like a sort of full operating system in the container. That's something I never quite understood. I guess the only reason that I could see is that it makes some things easier, but that sounds like just something that you would want early doing deployment or experimentation. Okay, so first of all, um, I will note that it sounds, you know, you talk about having the container management system to provide those facilities. Um, you, you need to be very careful that you didn't just widen your security attack surface. Because um, if I'm willing to widen my security attack surface, I can give the container cap admin and whatever else it needs and, you know, it'll work today. Um, so there are two reasons why I kind of want those services in the container. First of all, I would like to use containers as white white lightweight virtualization um, instead of running VMs. Um, for reasonably trusted services, um, 
you know, I would like to be able to containers provide better sharing of a file system and memory resources than VMs do. Uh, and I like to take advantage of that and still get security isolation between services. Um, as far, but long term, I mean, the, the, the argument basically as my daemons is, that, for example, let's say that my web server or, or um, some other service starts using socket activations um, or services start wanting to be able to run subservices in C groups like say, say my web server forks off um, some application services and wants to run them in its own C group. And um, I want to handle the C group management the same inside the container as I do outside the container, then I'm going to uh, want to use something that looks a lot like system D scopes. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, no, uh, I can see use cases for both those scenarios. One where there's a very hard separation between container, the guest container and the host, and another one where you know there's some the boundaries a bit more porous, and some system D bits and pieces can get through. Um, in fact, well, yeah, if you start doing that, I mean, why not? Why we? Why would you use Docker at all? Can't you have a, all the features of Docker kind of integrated into System D or as part of the operating system in general rather than uh, well, relying on Docker to provide right. everything. Yeah. Well, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> it's a, no, it's a nice example of a, I mean, it's very, it's very concrete. So I was using that as an, an example, but, but yeah. I mean, I, I'm more looking at, oh. so, I mean, I'm more looking at System D's container support and or LXC. Um, they seem to have more knobs that I can tune that, that are yeah. security related. Hmm, okay, yeah, good point. <coughs> I'll put that down. Uh. From the IOC, uh, that containers widen your attack surface to begin with because you share the kernel with the host. And so you would need to put your container manager in a VM if you are actually worried about that. As I said, from the ISC, not from me. Yeah, uh, that seems to be what people are doing. Is just running, for security reasons, just running uh, Docker inside a VM, which seems to defeat the purpose of the whole uh, Wait, containerization container thing. Inside a VM? Uh, sorry, running Docker inside a VM and then running containers inside Docker. Okay. To avoid the security, which it seems a bit silly, but it's. Uh, um, I guess that's where uh, what clear that's where clear containers come in, where we're trying to use uh, some of the uh, hardware isolation features of virtualization to provide uh, more security for containers without having to do full hardware virtualization. So. Okay, since, since I still have some mic, I will <laughs> take advantage <laughs> of ahead. it. No. Um, so I've been looking uh, during DebConf at the uh, uh, sandbox that is used by Sandstorm, which is, uh, so sand I mean, Sandstorm doesn't claim to be doing containers. They say they are a framework for running web applications in isolation and blah, but turns out internally they are doing very tiny containers and basically they have a at least they have uh, pretty strong security claims. Uh, and I, you can talk to Ashish about that. Uh, yeah, and basically, like for instance, they, they did a survey of, the, of all kernel vulnerabilities over the last 18 months, and they kind of concluded that 95% of those were completely not relevant uh, inside their sandbox because they were using syscalls that were forbidden using sepconf or yeah. that they were using the sysfs which is, was not mounted and so on. Question is basically how hard or how easy is it to uh, get things running inside uh, that sandbox. It seems it's not too hard for the applications they have actually packaged. I talked to them but it's not completely obvious whether we can reasonably expect people to use uh, that kind of very strong sandbox uh, for general purpose container blah, I cannot speak English anymore. <laughs> for general purpose containers, damn it. 
Yeah, I think that's another uh, step on the journey to maturity after you've realised that you need to build your own containers, that yeah, perhaps Docker doesn't provide the... Uh, well, Docker's too restrictive in terms of what it does in security and other areas, and it's uh, easier to step, uh, you know, step outside Docker for a bit and start implementing the containers uh, with the lower level tools. Yep. Then we have to provide the tooling. <laughs> so I will repeat that with the mic. Then if we are stepping out of uh, the Docker ecosystem, we have to provide Debian users with the tooling to run containers sa safely. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it probably won't happen for Stretch, given how close the freeze is, but... I mean, to be clear, there's, there's been a lot of work that's been gone into, gone into LXC for Debian. Um, and it's, you know, the, the, for example, there seems to be a reasonable second policy. Um, they do a reasonably good job of um, setting up uh, the, the device um, controller uh, C group. Um, you do need to have a fair bit in your bounding set for most OSs. Um, although, interestingly, I will also note LXC has the, the really awesome mode um, that I can't ever get to work, but it seems like it would be great if it did, where you actually don't even run the container as root. You have no capabilities. Um, I don't quite understand how that's supposed to work with any modern distro, because, again, uh, because yeah. you get screwed by system B. But, <laughs> um, uh, but it seems like that worked for someone once in a majorly cool way. We're rapidly running out of my, getting out of my depth here in System D. <laughs> Are there any comments from this side of the room? I don't think, I don't think everyone's been on the other side. Oh, oh up the back. I don't know, I seem to be able to run LXE as non root with System D, but maybe I'm not aware of something. Oh, please tell me how. <laughs> <laughs> It's, I don't know, like, talk to me later and then we can discuss it. It's, I don't know. It seems to be working. Uh, what's your name? Guido. Guido. Oh, okay. If I, I, I hear. Okay, so uh, one possible solution I can think of is running actually a systemd user session as a regular user inside the restricted container, but mm -hmm. yep. that won't get you far if you need to do fancy things with the kernel, probably. So um, since I have the mic and there seems to be nobody else interested, um, one of the things I really don't like about Docker is that it pushes forward towards a um, culture of bundling everything. So containers is not a take it or leave it technology. It has different levels. I mean, you have C groups and then you have namespaces and you can pick the ones that fit your needs to actually do what you want. And uh, in that respect, System D is doing a lot better. I mean, uh, I would really like to see uh, services in Debian coming with um, namespace isolation turned on by default. If they don't need network support, then set private network to yes, for example. So this is not containers in the sense that we treated in this both, I guess, but it's still um, a step forward to get people accustomed to the fact that there is no single network namespace in your system, there is no single file system namespace in your system. So. It's a kind of, let's say, a solution in between. So, yeah. yeah so that's something I completely agree, agree is valuable. And I've actually tried to get some uh, the, uh, the maintenance of some packages I use um, to accept patches uh, that do that kind of thing. Um, problem is that quite a few people seem to not be too fond of the idea of having a service that behaves differently uh, when it's running under systemd or not, or even 
um, having uh, anything at all to do with systemd, which makes me quite sad in the end because, I mean, you, we decided to ship systemd, so now it's, well, it's kind of difficult to to see people just pretending that this thing never happened. But, and on the other hand, those are, okay, those are systemd specific features to some extent, but uh, they are also, I think, as you mentioned, they are extremely valuable in terms of what you can do for security. For people who might not be, um, um, who might not be aware of those yet, basically you can do things such as uh, making the entire file system read-only, or giving uh, the restrict restricting sorry the applications access to network or to uh, raw devices or and so on and so forth, and or prevent it from accessing some specific directories like varlog. Uh, and yeah, basically many services we ship today could probably ship with read-only directories slash and read-write directory some subset of this, but it's yeah. a lot, I think a bit, big part of the problem is also social, it's conv uh, convincing other DDs to care about this. This might be an area, we had a roadmap buff this morning. Um, this might be an area where getting that sort of thing onto the Debian roadmap um, is is a good idea. I will note as a maintainer who has done some of that, um, it does generate more bugs for you. As people whine that, you know, when they change their configuration, they didn't update the system deconfiguration and it doesn't work anymore. Yes, that's true. There is also some work to be done, also educating the users about what uh, was what this entails. But I mean, and I agree so to some extent that it's bad to kind of break user expectations. But the user expectation also include my system be secure. Does it seems to me there's a uh, move towards sandboxing? Uh, Sorry? Sorry. What? I just said sorry. Oh, okay. Um, no, I was saying, trying to say that there seems to be a move to sandboxing system services more. I know that Mac OS, is, I mean, they run all, all the apps are run, App Store apps are run inside a sandbox, and I think they're trying to roll that out to other system services. Does anyone know if Red Hat or Ubuntu or other distros are sandboxing their uh, internal services? Yeah, so um, Debian kind of is behind the, the world in this regard. Um, uh -huh. Ubuntu, you know, uses AppArmor by default. Um, and Red Hat has put a lot of um, effort, at least for enterprise Linux, behind SE Linux mm. and does a, a bunch of stuff with that. And I do know a lot of people who deploy production Red Hat systems with SE Linux in enforcing mode. So, yeah, um, we're kind of behind on that front. Yeah, I guess there's a bit of overlap between the the security uh, policy tools and uh, putting things in containers. Mm. <laughs> okay, we're just about exhausted talking about Docker or not Docker. Might write down a. Um, so thanks. One question for me actually to all of us is, I mean, we currently think nobody well where we currently are with uh, virtualization containerization, but what do we expect to be happening next? So are we believing that in five years we say, oh yeah, we everybody use Docker and nothing else anymore? Mm -hmm. or is a, uh, do we say, look back in five years and say, well, yeah, Docker was like CVS, it was great when it was invented, <laughs> but not so good anymore now. Uh, well, yeah, basically, what do we expect that might be happening? That would be a really interesting thing for me. And that's a totally open question, of course. Yeah, I rather like the direction. Uh, <laughs> System D is going in terms of yeah sandboxing services without running Docker, so more 
integration of containers, LXC inside the system itself rather than uh, uh, outsourcing that to another app like Docker. So that's what I think is going to happen anyway. Yeah, so something I wanted to mention since it's let's say somewhat on topic, most of the container related tools are written in Go except for basically systemd and spawn and LXC as far as I'm aware. And currently we have no good story about shipping security updates for Go packages. It's simple, currently in Jesse there is no Go packages, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, for Stretch, for instance, we need to have uh, the, this thing solved. And the main issue is that Go basically uses static linking there is some experimental dynamic linking, but basically nobody uses it like for real. And I doubt we want to try to get this in the archive uh, like half a year before freeze. And so, yeah, basically um, that's a big issue for stretch because if we cannot have um, if we cannot solve uh, the problem of how we ship uh, or how we handle security updates for Go packages, it means we will have no Go packages, which means we will not have Docker, we will not have Rocket, we will not have any of the other fancy doc uh, container tools except for systemd and spawn and LXC. And yeah, it's, I guess, more a call for help slash contribution. Hmm. Yeah, but even then, we currently we don't have uh, the tooling to, um, once we have done one uh, library update, then <coughs> update uh, all the packages that ship binaries and transitively depend on them. Yeah. I'm not sure, yeah, I'm not sure anyone has tested the experimental dy dynamic linking stuff on all platforms. I think there's some horrible bugs hiding in there. So uh, what you describe about Go is essentially the same problem Haskell has because it yeah. also does some static linking. And as far as I know, the Haskell team uh, has some tools in place that schedule bin and MUs for uh, packages after a library has been updated. So it seems there's common ground there and there could be, um, let's say, language agnostic solution to some extent. So Haskell and Go the same Go Go does the same, I think. Golang DH Golang does the same. It uses virtual provides basically with a hash of what actually this library uh, version was when it was built. But yeah. I have to admit Um, so this might be changing tack in some ways. Uh, just from a, a lot of this is going over my head, so maybe coming from a sort of noob perspective, Docker is very easy to use, um, and and sort of containers, at least from my perspective, took off uh, with Docker. Um, you know, just just Docker make, and you know, off you go, um, kind of stuff. And you have your Docker file, and you know, we we run Docker in in production with Kubernetes, and it's it's very easy to use, and it's much easier. Uh, not to mess up as badly as you can mess up vagrants, uh, you know, and, and getting into the mindset of using, um, you, you know, machines that you can kill and bring up again, and, and the mindset of containers, it's very easy for someone like me to use. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, that, that needs to be thought about, that it, it's kind of taking over the world from that angle more than a security, uh, you know, having everything right, because Alexi is quite hard to use as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I have to admit, I've never managed to get LXC working by hand <laughs> myself. It's a Docker year, right? Docker is way, way easier. Um, yeah, and it's kind of two use cases, it sounds like, um, the development versus um, you know, production stuff. But yeah. I, um, yeah, I use Docker all the time for just messing around too. I'm not, being, I'm not too concerned about security in that case, but. Hmm, which one, Sam? Sorry? No, no, I, I was, never mind. Oh, sorry. <laughs>
Sea of Truth, oh, right, no, okay. Like sea of Truth. I mean, the, That's true. I, can't, I couldn't get that working in it anyway. <laughs> okay, well, if uh, there aren't any more things to say, thank you for coming, everyone. And you can have a 10 minute early mark, perhaps. So, thanks.